الله ربنا هو الاله on behalf of the the president the honorable trustees and the committee members of the organizer of tonight's program the islamic propagation society international of penang malaysia i mohammed sirajuddin being the moderator welcome you all with the universal greetings of peace and blessings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh which means may the peace and blessings of allah the almighty come upon all of you alhamdulillah all praise be to allah we are truly fortunate tonight that we have with us a distinguished scholar of islam and author of many books and lectures on a wide range of subjects from comparative religion to international politics to islamic finance to sociology and most remarkably on the much debated subject of islamic eschatology on which he wrote the international bestseller Jerusalem in the Quran which has been translated into several languages he is none other than our very dearest and esteemed scholar of islam sitting on my left maulana sheikh imran hussein for those of you here who have been following the public talks organized by IPSI for many years sheikh imran is certainly no stranger In fact, he is more than just a guest speaker. He will always be regarded as our beloved uncle, teacher, and one of IPSI's mentor and guiding light. In fact, IPSI's association with Sheikh Imran Hussein goes back almost 12 years ago, when he was first introduced to the people of Penang by the president of IPSI, Brother Kamarudin Abdullah. I will not take up more of your time in trying to introduce our honorable speaker. Instead, I will invite you to read his books, which are available at the foyer, or visit his official website at imranhussein.org. Imranhussein.org, the official website, to capture his profile. And now, without further ado, I now call upon Maulana Sheikh Imran Hussein. to help us better understand on what is happening in the modern arab world and what repercussions it holds for the future as with this i call upon sheikh imran alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salam ala ibadihi alladhina istafa khususan ala afdali khatam an-nabi محمد بن ابي وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد we begin with Allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers And our father Adam, and our father Abraham, and on Moses, and on Jesus, and on his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Brother Chairman, fondly known as General Siraj, Brother Chairman. Brother President and members of the IPSI, brothers and sisters here in Pinan, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our chairman is a young man. He knows only about 12 years of my visits to Pinan. But my first visit was actually 21 years ago. <laughs> coming regularly for the last 21 years. Well, I was here 5 years ago in 
2007. And we thank Allah who in His kindness has made it possible for us to come back to you here in Bidang one more time. Tonight's topic is connected with tomorrow night's topic. In tonight's topic, we bring political and economic analysis to bear on the subject. But in tomorrow night's lecture, we give you more of the, it's a big word, eschatological. Eschatology is simply what every Muslim knows. In the subject, the study of the end time. In English, this big word, eschatology. So tomorrow night, we look at the Quran and after the Zalai. Tonight, we look at an Islamic view of the current Arab uprisings. And we want to make a distinction at the very beginning between the demonstration, you have here in Malaysia, demonstrations and an uprising as you had in Tunisia, as you had in Egypt, as you had in bringing down the Soviet Union. And then the last term would be an insurrection, an armed insurrection. As you had in Libya, and you now have in Syria. But all of these we have brought together in one term, uprising. It would be only proper for us to locate the current Arab uprisings in a larger picture. Many other things are happening at the same time, not just the Arab uprisings. The US dollar is about to collapse. And when it collapses, it's going to bring down the world of paper money. And that is going to cause chaos in many parts of the world. It might even provoke riots in the United States of America. And uh, do not be surprised if martial law is proclaimed uh, uh, in the United States. The Arab uprisings are taking place not only at a time when the U.S. dollar is about to collapse, the U.S. economy is about to collapse. Fundamental change taking place in the world of money. But also at a time when NATO, NATO which we can now recognize to be a Zionist organization. The Zionist NATO is on the rampage. And uh, it will not be long before we see an attack on Pakistan. The purpose being to destroy Pakistan's nuclear plants, nuclear weapons, and denuclearize Pakistan. Why? Because the world of Islam must not have any weapon that can pose a threat to Israel. Simple. We are also located at a time when an attack on Iran is imminent. 
Iran is not an Arab country. We are located at a moment in time when if an attack on Iran is launched, it will not be too difficult for us to understand that it will eventually, almost certainly, lead to nuclear war. And this would not be nuclear war with one or two nuclear weapons exploding. No, we're talking about nuclear war between the two giants, between the American-led alliance, which has NATO as its military arm, and the Russian Netherlands, which has China in support of Russia. And that nuclear war is going to bring about a substantial reduction in the population of North America and Europe. Because the weapons are going to be directed basically towards the East North America. And so the Arab uprisings are not taking place in a vacuum. And it is therefore necessary for us, even here in beautiful Kidan, it is necessary for us to locate the bigger picture, to understand what's happening. One year ago, I gave my first lecture on this subject. It was in Cape Town, I believe, in March of last year. And then in April, I repeated the lecture several times in Malaysia, in, in Kuala Lumpur. And you may have viewed that lecture on YouTube. But tonight we revisit the subject to update our analysis. For at the time when we gave those lectures, the attack on Libya had not yet taken place. And the uprising in Syria had not as yet reached the state where it is today. And so tonight let us look to see whether we can understand whether these uprisings are taking place by chance or by design? And if by design, for what purpose and for what end? It was in 2002, Brother Chairman, when you were a young man, I gave, I gave a lecture in Sydney, Australia, entitled Beyond September 11th, What Does the Future Hold for the World of Islam? And that lecture, ten years later, suddenly made me a famous man. <laughs> because in that lecture, in 2002, I was anticipating an attack on Iraq, which is about to be launched. It was in fact launched in 2003. And I thought that once the attack on Iraq takes place, it's going to create uprisings in the Arab world. And the pro-American dictators and their regime, they would have fall with a domino effect. <coughs> that Al Jazeera was going to play a very significant role in allowing these uprisings to become successful. And that if, as I, made, I made the comment that I believe Jordan will be the first to fall. And I said, King Abdullah probably already had his suitcases packed. <laughs> Those of you who listened to that lecture. Of course, I was wrong. 
It didn't come in 2004. It came 10 years later, or six years later. And Jordan did not fall. The first was Tunisia. But in that lecture, I said the reason why Israel will be smiling when all of these Arab uprisings take place and all of these pro-American dictators fall is because in their wake will come Islamic governments, so-called Islamic governments. And when these so-called Islamic governments come to power, particularly in Egypt, they are going to have to support the Palestinian people. They're going to have to support Gaza. And Israel will then have an opportunity to cry terrorism. But the wall of Islam is rising. And Israel is going to get its throat cut. That Islam poses a menace to mankind and to the state of Israel. And that all the media around the world are going to be beating the drums, warning mankind. Muslims want to take over the world. And Israel will then get what is known as cause of spell. A justification for waging a big war. That part of the analysis was very correct. That was very correct. The one about Jordan was a mistake. The timing was a mistake. But the general analysis was correct. And that lecture gave me a very famous smile. People wonder oh, how Sheikh Ibrahim was able to see since 2002 that this is going to happen now. <laughs> it's a pity. Because the Arabs themselves do not understand what is happening in the Arab world. The Islamic movements themselves in the Arab world, the Ikhwan al-Muslim in Egypt, the Islamic party in Tunisia, the Salafis, who are in the political process, they themselves do not understand what is happening in the Arab world. They have already succeeded in Tunisia. An uprising took place in Tunisia and it was spontaneous. No one in their right head could say that Israel planned all of this. No. And the uprising reached a crescendo so quickly that the Tunisian dictator who had ruled for some 30 years or so, eventually had to flee. How do we explain that Tunisian uprising? I do not have unlimited time tonight, so I'm going to have to get some corners. We are very familiar in our part of the world, but you don't have it here in Malaysia, with two seasons, a dry season with no rain and a rainy season with plenty rain. And in the dry season we notice that the grass turns brown. And the grass on the side of the road, the heat causes bushfires. And these bushfires can spread. When there is no rain, the land becomes parched. And one simple spark can cause a big conflagration, which can burn down thousands and thousands of acres. That is what happened in Tunisia. No rain in Tunisia. The rain being river being used to reduce the people to poverty and destitution. Now when I speak of the Jewish money lender, 
and I say that what he is doing is rotten, why shouldn't you be annoyed with me? Didn't Shakespeare do the same thing in Merchant of Venice? Hasn't history also done the same thing? in pointing to money lending as something like a blood sucking all through history are you going to whitewash thousands of years of history in this modern age to make the bank respectable no money lending banking system reduced the people to poverty but that was not the only attack it was also the paper money. You may have seen my book, The Gold in Our and Silver Durham, Islam and the Future of Money. I need to rewrite this book now because there's new analysis now. You take a piece of paper and you print a picture and you put a number on it and you give to that piece of paper an entirely fictitious value. And then you get the world to demand that paper. By making a deal with Saudi Arabia and OPEC, that nobody can buy oil, which is the largest commodity sold in the world market. Nobody can buy oil without this paper. So you guarantee that the paper will be demanded. You created wealth out of nothing. Are you God? Only God can create wealth out of nothing. This is an act of shirk. I wish Kalantan could be here to listen to me today. <laughs> this is an act of shirk. Huh? And this paper money was used and is still being used to reduce the people to abject poverty and destitution. Those who don't understand that subject, they have hope work to do. And that includes the world of Islamic scholarship. You can't get one Mufti, or one Ali, one scholar of Islam, strutting around the world and lecturing, but they cannot ever speak the truth and say, this is bogus, this is fraudulent, this is haram. Wait until you're in the grave, and then you remember me. And so Tunisia has no rain, it's dry, it's parched because of river. And on top of that, you ensure that the governments which rule over the Muslims are governments that oppress them. If you were seen going to the masjid in Tunisia, you could be arrested. Tunisia writing to me to tell me that. When that oppression reached a level of saturation, then one little spark can cause a con conflagration. That's what happened in Tunisia. They planned it and they knew it could happen. And it did happen. The same thing happened in Egypt. Egypt today has been reduced to abject poverty and destitution, the masses. While some Egyptians are riding on the gravy train, oh yes, living a good life, the Egyptian masses are in poverty and destitution because of riba. And yet the world of Islamic scholarship cannot recognize and would not stand up and wage a jihad against riba. These two that occurred in Tunisia and in Egypt. I noticed that the Tunisian armed forces eventually backed out. And the Egyptian armed forces from day one adopted a soft policy. A suspiciously docile policy, the Egyptian armed forces. And so the head was cut off. And Zainul Abidin fled and Hosni Mubarak fled. But guess what? The armed forces still remain in charge. The same Egyptian armed forces who prevented the Palestinians in Gaza four years ago who were being slaughtered 
and Egypt block the passageway that you could not come into Egypt. And no supplies could go to them to help them. That same Egyptian armed forces still in control in Egypt. You can fool the others, you can't fool me. These were uprisings. And they have already fulfilled the purpose for which it was intended. And that is that after the uprisings take place, the armed forces will then announce elections. And I was able to recognize six, eight months ago that these elections are going to win result in runaway victory for the Islamic parties. And that's what Israel wants. And that's what the Egyptian armed forces want. And that's what happened. But in Libya it was different. In Libya, they planned an insurrection. And a huge amount of arms was secretly ferried into Libya. Where could it have come from? Not from the air, not from the sea. It had to come from Egypt. It could not have come from Egypt without the knowledge of the Egyptian armed forces. And I suspect that the Egyptian armed forces were up to it in their neck in sending those arms over to Libya. And so that the Egyptian armed forces are part and parcel of the effort to bring about an insurrection in Libya. So who is the Egyptian armed forces working for? I see an uncanny link between the Egyptian armed forces and NATO between the Egyptian armed forces and Israel. Because of these, these remarks I am not making now, I cannot travel to Egypt anymore. Even though there are large numbers of students of mine in Egypt begging me to come. But the truth has to be spoken, regardless of the price we have to pay. The Egyptian armed forces have played a significant role in bringing about the Libyan insurrection. And the NATO got the resolution to be passed in the Security Council. And the Russians were taken for a ride. And the Chinese were taken for a ride. DC. And once they got that Security Council resolution, then the insurrection could succeed. Without that, it could not have succeeded. No. So now NATO is bombing from the sky. Yes, of course, Gaddafi. Now we are told he's such a big dictator. And we cannot tolerate anymore this dictatorship. The oppression in Libya is so great. And Libya under Gaddafi was a better place to live than the Libya today. Yeah. I have not come here to speak, to defend Gaddafi. I found him acting like a clown sometimes, with women as his bodyguards with a green book. But the fact is that what they did in Libya was shameless. To bring down the Libyan government and the manner in which they did it. They waited until it was Ramallah. They waited until it was the time of breaking the fast. And at that time, even the soldiers would put down their guns to go and break the fast.
and these wicked people, and they will be punished for it one day. Then he merged out of hiding from where they were and started shooting indiscriminately people who were about to break the fast, creating panic in Tripoli. Is this the way Muslims behave? Or is this the way dogs behave? Even a dog, even a dog has a greater moral sense than this. That you are a Muslim and you choose a moment when the people are breaking the fast to go and kill 1200 people in Tripoli, create panic in Tripoli, and use that with NATO firing from above to eventually take the city of Tripoli. That's how it was done. Shame on them. Shame on them. Shame on them. I responded to what they did in Libya by quoting the Quran. And I have to take a little time to quote this verse tonight, although it belongs to it tomorrow night as well. And those of you who are Muslims, I want you to listen carefully to this verse of the Quran. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us a lesson at the beginning of the Quran, how to study the Quran. He says, he ordered the angels to bow down to Adam, alayhi salam. And they all bowed down, they all prostrated, except at least Satan. If we take this verse by itself in isolation, using the wrong methodology, then it please had to be an angel. Oh yeah, because the order was given to the angels. But that's the wrong methodology. You do not ever study a verse in isolation. <laughs> when we go to the rest of the Quran, we find out no. the place is not an angel. That's wrong. Several verses of the Quran must be brought to bear on this subject. Similarly, with this verse of the Quran, of Surah Al Naira, and the Libyan Islamic movement were overthrown. Ghazafi didn't know about this verse of the Quran. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who have faith in Allah, the one God, the God of Abraham, alayhi salam. La tattakhidu al-yahuda wa al-nasara awkiya. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. <coughs> Is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians? The lazy man's methodology would lead you to that conclusion. But if you use the proper methodology, no. Allah could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians because of several verses of the Quran, which we do not have the time to bring before you tonight, maybe tomorrow night. <coughs> well then, if he's not talking about all Jews and all Christians, which Jews and which Christians? The answer lies in the words which follow. But for 1400 years, Islamic scholarship could not understand. Because events had not as yet unfolded. Which Jews and which Christians? The answer is there. Ba'aduhum awliya Allah. Allah is saying, do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. In other words, the Quran is anticipating an event which is still to occur. That there would be a mysterious reconciliation between part of the Christian world and part of the Jewish world. 
and then a Jewish Christian, a Judeo Christian friendship and alliance will emerge. When that happens, Allah says you are prohibited from being their friends and allies. Allah is not speaking about your Christian neighbor who lives next to you here in Pinan. And when you run short of sugar, you ask your Christian neighbor for some sugar. No. Nor is he talking about your Jewish neighbor. He is talking about the Judeo-Christian alliance. And that alliance has now emerged. Today we recognize it as a Zionist Judeo-Christian alliance, which has NATO as its military arm. If you become their friends and allies, as they did in Libya, what is the price that you will pay? If you become their friends and allies, as you are doing now in Syria, what is the price that you will pay. The Quran answers, Whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance, as you did in Libya, as you're now doing in Syria, as the Turkish government has done. You've lost your Islam. You've got a surprise waiting for you when you go in the grave. I hope the Turkish Prime Minister hears that. You've got a surprise waiting for you when you go in your grave. Allah warns you, وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Do not allow death to overtake you while you are not again in the state of Islam. Submission to the one God. You lost your Islam. Whosoever from amongst you turn to them, you now belong to them, said Allah. You no longer belong to us. You've lost your Islam. In Allah, Allah, and you call them in surely Allah does not provide guidance for a people who have as their trademark oppression and wickedness. And this is what happened in Libya. Why did they want this insurrection in Libya? Answer. Of course it's the oil. <laughs> of course it's the oil. But that's not the whole story. It's more than that. Of course it's because they want to rule the whole world. Oh yes. We're not dreaming when we say that. And thank Allah that Mr. Putin in Russia understands that now. And thank Allah that the Chinese government now understands that, that these fellows want to rule the whole world, including China and including Russia. The Chinese in Singapore may bend their knee to Israel, but China will not do that. The Chinese in Singapore will bend their knees and kiss Israel's foot, but China will not do that. Tell that to Singapore for me. China will not do that. And Russia will not do that. Of course they want to rule the world. And they want to show their capacity by taking down the Libyan government. And so Libya is now a NATO state. NATO is not going to leave Libya. But there's another reason, which belongs to eschatology. You see somebody, the Quran tells us, Somebody rewrote the Bible and made some changes in it. And because of those changes, we now have nuclear war coming up with millions and millions going to die. They wrote that the Holy Land extends from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. That's false. That is false. The Holy Land does not extend from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates, that is false. But it's there in the Bible. When you read Jerusalem in the Quran, we now have this book in 
Bahasa as well. Bahasa Malay. Then you'll understand why they made that change in the Bible. And because that change is there, those who want to rule the world actually want to deliver that rule over the world to Israel. So that a man can rule over Israel tomorrow and from Israel rule over the world. And that man will then declare, I am the Messiah, al Masih. Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, a man who never went to school, could not read and could not write, never traveled out of Arabia. That man in the desert described to us 1400 years ago, this man who will stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah. But of course he would not be the Messiah. The Messiah will be the son of a virgin woman. <laughs> the Messiah is Jesus, the son of Mary. But this man will claim to be the Messiah. The Christians know him as the Antichrist. And we know him as the child of the false Messiah. In order for him to convince the Jews that he is indeed the Messiah, not only must Israel become the ruling state in the world, and therefore the United States had to be brought down. And before I end, I hope I have time to show you what possible military strategy Israel has to bring down the United States. Remind me, maybe in the question and answer later. But, in addition, because of what is in the Bible, the territory of the state of Israel will have to expand to encompass all of that territory from the river Nile to the river Euphrates. You cannot do that with only an attack from the air or with naval bombardment. You've got to bring in land troops to take the eastern delta of Egypt. And so Israel is planning a war on Egypt in order to seize this territory because the Bible says it belongs to Israel. All the diplomatic missions in Cairo are located on the east bank of the River Nile. Except the Israeli embassy. <laughs> the Israeli embassy is located on the west bank of the river Nile. Why? Because Israel recognizes the east bank of the Israeli territory. That's why. Uh -huh. If you have to launch an attack on Egypt, then you have to bring in ground troops not only from Israel but also from the east. And that's why you need not you need NATO in Libya. So it's not just the oil, it's more than that. You see that when the time comes, they'll be able to attack Egypt from both sides. But the foolish, the foolish, and that's the kindest word I could think of, the foolish, so-called Islamic warriors, who went about bringing down the Libyan government didn't know that they were playing into the Zionist hands and that they have a terrible punishment awaiting them when they stand before Allah and judgment day. Syria is a far more complex case. We don't have the time to look at Libya and Yemen. Nor do we have the time tonight to look at Bahrain, which is a very, very interesting case, Bahrain, because I want to spend some time on Syria and lay the foundation tonight for the analysis we should conduct tomorrow on Islamic eschatology from the Quran. What does 
Zionists did was, in the wake of the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles, to break up the Ottoman Islamic Empire and to bring some territories under French control and some under British. So Egypt went to Britain. And Jordan went to Britain, and Iraq went to Britain. That's a large part of it. But Lebanon went to France. And Syria went to France. And it was the French government, the French Zionists, who in the 1960s, I believe, brought the Assad family to power and the Alawi, who are a small sect, breakaway sect from the Shia, who, if I'm wrong, is correctly believe that Ali or the Allah Ta'ala who is divine, which is nonsense, which is shit. This is what they believe. Yet this breakaway sect, which constitute about 12% of the population, See his power in a military coup d'etat, supported by France. And Hafiz al-Assad becomes the ruler. And Hafiz al-Assad imposes upon Syria's Muslims, Sunni Muslims, the same kind of oppression, biting oppression, that was visited upon the people of Tunisia, the people of Egypt by Hosni Mubar, by Zainul Abidin. And when the Sunni Muslims of Syria rose up in revolt against Hafiz al-Assad, he slaughtered, I think, 10, 20,000 people in order to maintain his rule. So the Alawi government in Syria lacks moral authority lacks religious authority, lacks even democratic credentials to rule over Syria. But nobody could remove them. No. Because the Zionists supported them. The Zionists kept them there until it was time when the Zionists no longer needed them to remove them. And so, the same kind of insurrection is now taking place in Syria. And we hear the same stories about how Bashar al-Assad is such a dictator. Of course, we know he's a dictator. What's new? That Gaddafi was a dictator. Of course, we know he's a dictator. What's new? What's new? We know all these years. All these years we did. But who kept them there on the time? The Zionists. And so now the insurrection is taking place in Syria. But Russia has learned a lesson. And China has learned a lesson. Syria doesn't have oil. India has oil. But Syria has a naval port, which is a Russian naval port. And it is the only naval port that Russia has in the whole Mediterranean, in Syria. So if the Zionists take over Syria, as they have taken over Libya, that's goodbye to Russia as a Mediterranean, Mediterranean, Mediterranean naval power. You lose your naval power. Not only that, the Zionists believe that the road to Tehran lies to Damascus <laughs> because Syria and Iran are firm allies of each other and if your target is Iran then it makes sense to get rid of Iran's firm ally in Syria and that's why the struggle is now being waged the Turkish armed forces are playing the same role in Syria 
that the Egyptian armed forces play in Libya. The Turkish armed forces are bringing the weapons into Syria and sending the men, arming them with Zionist weapons and Zionist US dollars. And these foolish, that's the kindest word I could think of, these foolish Ikhwan warriors are not understanding that they are playing into the hands of the Zionists, are waging this do or die effort to bring down the regime. Our response is, if you want to bring down a dictator, someone who is oppressing you, someone who has no moral or religious right or even democratic right to rule over you, you have the right to wage a struggle for liberation from oppression. <coughs> we are not denying you that right. No. Because Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Hajj, وَزِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَادَرُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِيُونَ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ Allah has given you permission to wage an armed struggle for liberation from oppression. You don't need a security council resolution. Allah has given you permission in the Quran, but Allah has prohibited you from friendship and alliance with the Zionists. Judeo Christian Alliance, and they are the ones who are the mastermind behind the insurrection in Syria. What's going to happen? We know what happened in India. The answer is there's a, there's a word in English called attrition. You chip and you chip and you chip and you chip until eventually the tree will fall. So the Syrian regime cannot last forever. Now, if you continue this infiltration of armed warriors into Syria constantly, to this side, to this side, to that side, supporting them with state-of-the-art weaponry and with all the money that they need, eventually the Syrian government will fall. And when that happens, Syria is going to become another Zionist controlled state. And, this, and Russia will face a tremendous loss. This is why both Russia and China vetoed the recent Security Council resolution. Well then, what possible solution could there be if we are to prevent Syria or save Syria from becoming another Zionist controlled state? And there are those, maybe you have some sitting right here in this gathering, who are only too happy for Bashar Assad to go, and they don't care what comes after. We just want him to go. But we understand that the fall of the Bashar regime at this time will lead to the same result as in India. And so Syria will become another NATO state. What possible solution there can be? We have suggested that the Sunni majority Muslims of Syria, through their ulama, did the Prophet not say, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma barik lana fi shabina wa yamanina. All our grand blessings for us in our shah and our yaman. The answer is that this majority Sunni Muslims of Syria who are not willing to make friendship and alliance with the Zionists. They are the ones who must approach Russia. And they are the ones who must impress upon Russia. That you can bring about regime change in Syria. And Bashar Assad probably will be only too happy to step down. And the Sunni regime will take over. 
which will maintain friendship and alliance with Russia and with Iran. In order for that to take place, and for the slaughter and the oppression to end, that's what we want, but they don't want that. No, no, no. They want Syria to become another Zionist state. That's what they want. In order for that to take place, you must have your own land. And that's what we don't have today. I'm so sorry to say it. We do not have the ulama of Islam who have the knowledge of the inside to be able to offer this kind of guidance. When we meet tomorrow night, we're going to look to see a deeper analysis of the big picture focused on the uprising and the insurrections. But we've only touched on the big picture. We mentioned about the US dollar. We've mentioned about nuclear war and these things. But that bigger picture has to be expressed in greater detail. And we need from the Quran and from the Ahali. Let me give you one example before we end. Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. I'm sure you must have heard it. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said that the river Euphrates which is in Iraq will uncover a mountain of gold. But the believers must not touch it. <laughs> and people will fight over that gold. And 99 out of every 100 will be killed. We never understood this hadith. We never understood this studies until now. Until now. Praise be to Allah. The Salafi is a man who wants to live the way of life of the early Muslims. And Nabi Muhammad said about those early Muslims, they are the best. So the Salafi wants to replicate the way of life of the best Muslim. What's wrong with that? If you are Salafi, you should be walking in the footsteps of that companion, the Aslaf. You should be the model Muslim. But the Salafi make a mistake in the methodology. And when I offer the criticism, I do not do so in any vindictive, spiteful way. I'm not waging war. You, my brothers, so if I'm not waging war on you, why should you wage war on me? Huh? It's rather foolish. But this is knowledge. And in the world of knowledge, I have the right to offer a critical comment. That's my right. The Salafi says that there is no new knowledge in Islam. Everything that has to be interpreted has already been interpreted either by Allah or His Messenger or by the Islam. And since the Hadith says that a mountain of gold is going to come out of the river, that is what we're waiting for. A mountain of the metal is going to come out of the river. And when that happens, we are not allowed to touch that gold. But did the Prophet not say Did he not say Fear the firasa. The wisdom based on internal intuitive spiritual insight of the believer because when he sees, he sees with more than a PhD from USM. <laughs> 
He sees with the door of Allah. And if he is seeing with the door of Allah, with new knowledge, not come. And so we say the mountain is not an actual mountain. The word mountain symbolizes a very large quantity. And we say the gold is going to come out of the river, has already come. It's not the metal. But it is something that will have come out from under the river, which will function as gold. And therefore it is oil. The oil has come out from underneath the river, that entire basin. All the oil of Saudi Arabia is right there, this, this side, by the sea. Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, Iraq, Iran, all of it right there, by the river, river Euphrates. So we say it is oil. And we say that mountain of gold has already come, the oil is already here. And we say that there are two reasons why he does not want us to touch that oil. Two reasons. But before we explain the two reasons, he said that the people are going to fight over that oil. And 99 out of every 100 would be killed. You don't need a PhD in military science to understand. The conventional wars don't kill 99 out of every 100. No. So he's saying that you're going to have something like nuclear war, which kills 99 out of every 100. And so the battle that is now taking place in that region of the world, we can close our eyes and tell you it's going to lead to nuclear warfare because of this hadith. When nuclear warfare takes place, provoked by the Zionists, unleashed by the Zionists, I want to warn the Jews that mankind is going to hate you. The tide is going to turn against you all over the world. When millions and millions and millions are killed because you are unleashing these wars. Now let's go back. Don't touch that boat. One reason why we should not touch that boat has been with us for the last 40 years, but we didn't see it, including me. Including me. The other reason why we should not touch that boat is about to be understood. They don't teach the subject in the Darul Ulum. So our ulama have no knowledge of this subject. International Monetary Economics. In 1944, at Bretton Woods, the Zionists were able to pull off a magnificent victory in the creation of a new international monetary system in which only one paper money, only one, would function as a check that you can cash. A paper note is like a check. I owe you some money, so I write out a statement and I sign. It's a legal document. Provided I can cash it. It's valid, it's halal. So the US dollar was chosen. And the US dollar was convertible into gold at $35 for one ounce. International law required the United States to change US dollars to gold to the $5 an ounce. The problem was only governments could change. People could not. So that was 99% haram, 41% haram. 
But nobody went to Uncle Sam to change the dollar for gold. Until in 1971, I think it was Britain that did it, or France, one or the other. And the United States knew that the game was up. We didn't have enough gold for all the paper we printed. It's like writing checks and you don't have the money in your account. You go to jail for that. So what the United States did in September 1971, and they have explained this here we done in the past, was to repudiate Bretton Woods and the International Monetary Fund. Try on. The US dollar is no longer convertible into gold. Well, if the US dollar is not convertible into gold, and we printed too many US dollars, so we don't have the gold to back it, what's going to happen? People are going to realize that this paper is very weak, and they will start turning away from it, and the US dollar is going to be keep on falling and falling and falling in value like the Bangladeshi Taka. So the United States needed something to replace the gold. And guess what they did? After, of course, assassinating King Faisal. In 1975, just after Faisal was assassinated, and the Saudis learned their lesson, you don't step on Uncle Tams, Uncle Sam's toes anymore. The Saudis agreed. And then they got the rest of the Arab producing countries to agree. Then we're going to use oil as gold. Meaning, nobody can buy oil without paying for it with US dollars. So whereas the US dollar was had a backing of gold before it now backed by oil. Since 1975. And so the US dollar became known since 1975 as the petrodollar. This is the Hadith. But nobody could understand it until today. If we had understood this Hadith, no Muslim with love for Muhammad would ever touch a US dollar. Because he said the believers must not touch it. If we had understood this hadith, no Muslim would have touched the US dollar. And then we could have recognized the Saudis for what they are traitors. Saudi Arabia today is Israel's most strategic ally in the world. And the Saudis and the Israelis are working together to bring down Uncle Sam. Oh yes, that's what happened. Now. So that's the first reason why he said don't touch that gold. The second reason we're about to understand now. The second reason is coming now. Don't touch that. Oil. What they did was the Zionists. Wherever in the world oil was discovered, they wanted to control it. They must have control of it. So when Dr. Muhammad Masadik, I'm taking too much time, only a few more minutes, nationalized Iranian oil in 1952, the CIA organized a coup d'etat to bring it down so they could recover control over the oil. They invaded Iraq to take control of Iraqi oil. They've taken control of Libyan oil. They've always had control over Saudi oil. They want control over Iranian oil. Why do the Zionists want to control all the oil of the world? Why? Why is it all, it's only a matter of time before Hugo Chavez is taken over? It is Venezuela. Why? Because when Israel takes over from the United States as the next ruling state of the world, and that's tomorrow's analysis. Israel wants to control all the oil. And when the US dollar collapses and brings down all the rest of the money in the world with it, not so much the hard currency like the Singapore 
dollar and the Australian dollar. But then Bangladeshi taka, the Pakistani rupee and the Indonesian rupee and the Egyptian pound and so on, and the Turkish lira. Then suddenly all of these masses of people are going to be much poorer than they already are. With the collapse of money. Your Pakistani rupee will be falling in value so fast that one loaf of bread will change price four times during the day. It has happened many times in history. Runaway inflation. If we were not using this bogus, fraudulent, haram paper money, we'd never know inflation. Not with gold and silver. And so now you are much poorer than you were before. But the price of oil has gone up four, five, ten times. And he's here to close the oil. But you need the oil. Because you walked into the trap. Blind, because you didn't have ulama. No. Your Darul Ulooms were not producing ulama. And so you walked into the trap. Your entire transportation system now is dependent on oil. Everything that moves is dependent on oil except bicycle. Thank Allah, Vietnam still has some bicycle rickshaws. <laughs> Your agriculture is dependent on oil, fertilizers. Your manufacturing is dependent on oil, your factories. Mm. So if you don't have oil, you will not have rice. If you do not have oil, you will not have rice. You don't have the money to buy the oil. Beyond your reach. Well then what are you going to do? You are trapped. You are going to have to bow down and worship the child. That's the price you have to pay. When you bow down and worship the child, then you will extend diplomatic recognition to Israel. And you will have an Israeli diplomatic embassy in Kuala Lumpur. And the Israeli ambassador will be sitting very comfortably in Kuala Lumpur eating satay. <laughs> Oh yes, that's why he said, don't touch the gold. We are now trapped and there is no way out. And the reason why we are trapped and there is no way out is because we didn't have all of that. Who could understand the world of politics and the world of economics? I've taken up now an hour and a quarter of your time. I don't want to take any more time. What I've done tonight, is to update my analysis of the Arab uprising and to point out that the purpose of the goal is to bring down these governments and replace them with so-called Islamic governments. So that these so-called Islamic governments will then extend greater support to the Palestinians, to Gaza. So that Israel will be able to cry wolf that Islam is rising in the world and Islam constitutes a menace to mankind. And Islam poses a threat to Israel. And so Israel will have a justification for waging the big wars that Israel wants to wage. And without which Israel cannot replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world. And without which Israel cannot rule the world. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may provide us with the know. We wish to be able to see and understand the world in which we live today. To recognize and penetrate its reality. And to find in Allah's guidance that with which we can respond in a manner that Allah will approve of. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta sabi alimu tu alina ya mulana inna kanta tu wa rahim. Blarf patika ya once again, our profound appreciation to Sheikh Imran and the questioners for having participated in this very informative session. This brief interaction, I'm sure, alhamdulillah, has served to enhance our comprehension and appreciation of the importance of my subject. All things must eventually come to an end. 
and as such we are now at the end of tonight's program. As a reminder, newly published titles by Sheikh Imran are available in the foyer and you'll also find a complete set of his lectures in DVD format which includes uh, several new titles not previously available. So we invite you to stop by at our booth on your way out. For our non-Muslim guests who are present here tonight, we are giving away books and pamphlets free for tonight, including copies of the uh, Quran translated free of charge, exclusively, exclusively for our non-Muslim guests who are here tonight. There's a, there's a notice whereby on the 28th of, 8th of uh, this month, February, at 8.30 p.m. at the day one SK4 USM that we organize an interfaith dialogue. An interfaith dialogue with the title How We Define God which involves speakers from the Muslim side, from Christianity, from Hinduism, Sikhism as well as Taoism. They are all involved in discussing this topic How We Define God 28th of February, 8.30 p.m. at Day 1 SK4 at University Science Malaysia. So inshallah, if you are available, take your time, be there at this interface dialogue. And those who have purchased the book, you can bring it forth later to the Sheikh to get a uh, photograph. Inshallah, Sheikh Ibrahim will be here with us again tomorrow night for another inspiring talk entitled The Quran and the End of Times. In a way, it will be a sequel, a continuation of tonight's presentation whereby all the major themes will be elaborated in greater detail. And this will be his uh, last talk in Penang for now, so please make it a point to inform your friends, colleagues and neighbors of this program and bring them along tomorrow night, inshallah. And please bring along the coupon, the entrance fee coupon we are given, please bring it along for tomorrow night as well. Inshallah, we hope to see all of you here again. With this, I bid you farewell, have a safe journey home, and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Allahu Rabbuna huwa al-ilahu, lahu min al-asma'i mustafahu, al-wahidu al-hayyu kadha al-maliku, wal-maliku al-maliku la shariku. الله ربنا هو الإله له من الأسماء مصطفى